Okay, um, I'm Kate Cahey, uh, Computation Institute, University of Chicago and Argonne National Lab. Um, I worked for the last about 10 years on a cloud computing uh, system called Nimbus. It's now recognized as the first open source infrastructure as a service uh, implementation. And I also, over the last five years, work, worked on a system uh, called FutureGrid. It's an experimental testbed, or was an experimental testbed. It ended in, uh, in September. So I've got experience both uh, in, in running experimental infrastructures, obviously, uh, quite a bit of uh, experience in cloud computing. Um, you see here a bunch of names. Uh, those are the copies on the Chameleon project. And rather than introducing them now, I will introduce them in the context of the work that they are doing on, uh, on the project. So hopefully, by the end of the talk, those won't be just names to you. Those will be real people uh, that you can talk to. And please talk to them about your concerns and about your requirements. That's what they're here for. Um, they came a long way to hear from you, so uh, let's talk to them. And if you don't remember who's doing what, come and contact me and, and demand to be introduced. I'll, I'll be happy to do that. So to start off the talk, uh, I wanted to go to a couple quotations. The first quotation, much used quotation from Donald Knuth, beware of bugs in the above code. I have only proved it correct, not tried it, right? Second quotation, Yogi Berra. <laughs> The difference between theory and practice is that in theory, there is no difference. In practice, there is one, right? So um, I think that those two quotations taken together really tell you all that you need to know about why we run experiments. Uh, it, there are simply limitations to our ability to model. Uh, we may build models that are incorrect, models that are too simple, or models that are too complex for us to uh, make progress effectively. And so we need to find simpler models that still have a good correspondence to reality. Uh, experimentation helps with all of that. Experimentation, of course, is not an end in itself. It's something that you know we need to be able to take those experiences and put them back into modeling, because that sums up our understanding of the universe. So with that, you know, what are the things, what are the research projects that we want to work on in cloud computing? Well, one of them is we live increasingly in a data producing society. So it's increasingly more possible to um, scatter uh, various uh, sensing devices that produce valuable data streams. We've got a bunch of personal devices that produce such data streams, social networks, and so forth. All of those things taken together turn the whole planet into one huge instrument that is going to be eventually producing more effective data than the one petabytes per second that is currently produced by LHC and CERN. And the question now is, can we use this data usefully, right? Can we, can we extract insight from this data? Can we correlate the data? Can we process it? What can we learn, right? There's, there's a lot of data that by itself is very unreliable, doesn't really mean anything. But if you take a lot of that data together, that actually provides useful, reliable information. But in order to turn this data into insight, you need scale. You need this piece of data to not be just a piece of data, but a piece of data in the context of a baseline, or piece of data correlated with many other pieces of data. And then in order to perform that correlation, you need computation facilities for a lot of data. So you need big compute, and you also need places to store and networks to move and, and facilities to manage this data. In other words, you need the ability to operate on large data volumes, on data that comes at you at great speed and, and with great variety. So we've got a lot of emergent opportunities in, in software-defined networking, software-defined storage, software-defined everything. Right? We've got um, a, a lot of interesting work that was being done in uh, cyber physical systems. And combining it all together, you know, we, we were wondering what kind of testbed do we need? And, and one thing that emerged from that is that we need to build to scale, right? That, that the next um, unbreakable barrier in, in, uh, in cloud computing research is going to be happening at scale. So we need facilities to, for big data, for big compute. Uh, we, uh, in other words, need a large scale testbed. Secondly, we need a testbed that is highly reconfigurable so that you can perform a range, a great range of experiments. We need to be able to connect that not just to hardware, but also to workloads that, uh, that people produce realistic workloads that represent what really happens in the cloud computing world, right? So that you don't 
validate your insight against um, made up oracles. And then we need to engage with communities. If we build a large scale test bed, um, a test bed like that needs to complement other test beds. Right? Genie is a wonderful uh, already existing distributed test bed. If we're going to emphasize large scale, we want to connect to that test bed. There are other experimental test beds, uh, Grid 5000 in France, for example, that we also wanted to connect to. So out of that came the idea of creating a, a, a large scale instrument, and we made it as large as we could possibly afford, right, to target big data, but co big compute and big instrument research. So our test bed, uh, and I'm going to go over the hardware uh, in, in a second, is going to consist of 650 nodes. That adds up to 14,500 uh, cores. To support big data experiments, we're going to have about five petabytes of disk, and, and I'll tell you in exactly what disk configurations. And we will have two sites connected with a 100 uh, G network. It's going to be a, a reconfigurable instrument that will allow users to do bare metal reconfiguration. We will also operate it as a single instrument. In other words, as a user, whether you go to, um, to the site at, uh, at TAC, the uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center at the University of, of Texas at Austin, or to the Computation Institute at the University of Chicago, you're going to see the same capabilities. You're going to be able to move between those sites seamlessly. And we're going to provide a graduated approach for ease of use, right? So we're going to target you know, uh, users who need a lot of control and have the necessary level of skill to handle that, um, that uh, to provide that control, and also educational users who may want to just simply use a cloud. Um, connected instruments. So uh, one of the uh, one of the most important requirements that that was brought up by users is that actually sometimes they manage to find hardware on which to run. But what is much harder these days is finding um, traces and workloads that represent real life um, uh, cloud computing usage. And it's hard to validate your new algorithm or, or the new infrastructure that, that you're building if you don't have such traces, right? Because, uh, because then you don't know if this is any good to anybody. So uh, one of the things that, uh, that we did is we built partnerships with uh, production clouds, production clouds in both scientific domain at CERN and in the Open Science Data Cloud, and, and partnerships with industry, specifically with Rackspace and Google, to obtain traces from, uh, from the clouds that they are running. This way, users will be able to, uh, to validate their research. And then, of course, we're also planning to partner with users, and I've got a slide in, 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 in about uh, five changes that will explain exactly how. We want Chameleon also to be a complementary instrument that connects to Genie, that connects to Grid 5000, and possibly other test beds. Right? We are emphasizing scale, and we would like to be able to uh, partner with others to leverage more distributed aspect of other test beds. So starting with hardware, and before I, I dive into hardware, I'd like to introduce uh, Dan Stancion. He's right there in the back corner. They're hiding. Okay, Dan, Dan is our facilities director. He's also director of the uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center. And uh, he is responsible for building the, the hardware architecture for this project. So if you want, I'm going to talk about hardware, but if you want more details about hardware, uh, our hardware, your hardware, hardware of the future, anything like that, talk to this man. Okay, make sure that you find him. I'm sure this is going to be a very interesting conversation. But to give you a quick overview of the hardware that, uh, that we will build is, first of all, to emphasize scale, we decided to have one large partition, one large homogeneous partition, where users will be able to run experiments at scale. This partition is going to consist of standard cloud units, each unit which will have uh, 42 compute nodes and four storage nodes. 42 compute nodes, are, those are Intel Haswell processors. Uh, four storage nodes, each node will have uh, 16 uh, two terabyte disks, so that makes it um, about uh, that makes it about 128 terabytes of storage per rack, and and altogether this uh, this adds up to over one petabyte of storage across the uh, standard compute units. Um, 
In addition, we will have 3.6 petabytes of a central file system. So one of the uh, requirements that uh, users shared with us when we were preparing this is they said, well, sometimes it's very, it takes a very long time to load up data to the, uh, to the test bed, right? It could take as much as a day. It's, it's definitely hard to run experiments uh, in a situation like that. So we said, well, we'll store some of those very data intensive uh, data sets on the test bed and we will have a large storage infrastructure, large persistent storage infrastructure to do that. Um, the sites uh, will be connected via the uh, 100G network. Like I said, we will have uh, standard um, uh, cloud units both in Chicago and in Texas. They are going to be identical. So if one site becomes unavailable for whatever reason, you will be able to move your work to the other site uh, without changing anything. So the uh, software infrastructure is going to be uh, the same as well. Uh, in addition to that, we will have heterogeneous cloud units, which will contain our microservers, Atom microservers, uh, large RAM nodes, uh, uh, FPGAs, Xeon files, and, and GPUs. Um, a little bit more detail on what I just said. We're going to have uh, 12 of those standard compute units. Uh, the allocations that you can make could be on the level of one standard compute unit. This is when you allocate the whole rack. This is when you can also allocate the switch on the rack and gain administrative uh, access to the switch so that you can reprogram network and experiment uh, with networks. You could um, allocate uh, multiple nodes within the SCU. You could allocate multiple standard compute units. Um, uh, you could even allocate the whole large partition that is currently attacked for uh, experiments on scalability. Or you could also allocate, for example, the storage nodes across SCUs. Um, each, um, uh, each rack is going to be equipped with Force 10 S6000 uh, OpenFlow enabled switches. We are in, in conversations with uh, Dell right now. Uh, they, are, they have uh, beta support for, for very basic uh, OpenFlow 1.3. By the time that, uh, that uh, the, this hardware actually makes it to our labs, uh, we're going to have features uh, in that 1.3 that you need to support interesting research. More about that later in the talk. Um, we're going to have, uh, right, the, uh, the uh, compute servers uh, on, on the switches are Dell R630s. Uh, Xeon Haswell processors, and uh, they have 128 gigabyte, gigabytes of RAM. There's more detail here on storage servers. I think I actually already covered that one. Moving on to heterogeneous cloud units. Oh, uh, one of the issues very important is going to have InfiniBand uh, network, and we've got on the team DK Panda, who is one of the world's leading experts in programming that network. Um, and I'll explain what he will be doing uh, later on as well. Uh, Chameleon core hardware, we're going to have a shared infrastructure of uh, consisting of the large disk that I already mentioned, and we're going to have a bunch of uh, management nodes working with that. Uh, Force 10 OpenFlow uh, enabled switches will aggregate to uh, 40 gigabit, gigabit uplinks from each unit and provide multiple links to a 100 gigabyte network uh, to uh, Internet 2. And then, so this is the hardware. What capabilities do we plan to offer you? So this is a, a general roadmap on how we see this graduated approach to uh, providing a trade-off between the control that the user can get and the ease of use that they can get. So first of all, we start at the bottom layer. Uh, for the most advanced users, you will be able to provision an isolated partition. And like I said, you will be able to provision per rack. You will be able to provision across racks, uh, flexible and mixing the hardware, mixing and matching the hardware to your needs. You will get bare metal access to those nodes and you know, will boot you into some basic environment. But essentially, you will be able to do whatever you want. You will be able to do multiple reboots, reconfigure the environment, uh, including BIOS. Uh, we will provide power on and off a capability and even access to console. So it will be a, a deeply reconfigurable testbed. Um, you will be able to 
reserve switches and reconfigure network via the um, open for 1.3 capabilities. So the types of experiments that you can run on this is uh, experiments with any type of experiment with operating system, any type of experiment with virtualization, and then you will be able to not only uh, run those experiments, but also run them at scale, right? To, so a, a lot of people these days are interested in running experiments at scale, and that allows you also to isolate effects like effect of noise on in, in a hypervisor, for example. Now, in order to do that, in order to uh, reconfigure resources deeply, of course, requires a, a certain level of skill. But once you have done it, you, can, you will be able to snapshot that environment, right? And by snapshot, I mean you will be able to save the, 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 the environment the same way you save a virtual machine today. So, right? so you won't have to recreate it, uh, the configured environment, but just simply snapshot it. And then you will be able to make it available to others, and, and they will be able to uh, build on your research. So this is what happens on the uh, lowest level. On the highest level, we will provide persistent clouds. So one cloud that we know that users told us that they are interested in right now is just a, a, an open stack cloud, uh, but just better instrumented. And this is very important for people who are developing things on top of cloud computing. Maybe they can't run um, experiments, repeatable experiments on a shared cloud, but it's important um, to, for, for the development of that research. It's important for many um, educational pro projects and so forth. So users who want to run on that level will be able to come to a ready-made cloud. And then to provide a bridge between those two capabilities, we also have this middle layer. And the, in the middle layer, we're going to use what uh, we used to call pre-configured images, but sort of not a very inspiring and maybe not a very correct name, but we're going to use chameleon appliances. And what that means is that if you have something like a, like a virtual cluster, for example, that uh, represents an environment, you will be able to snapshot those images, but you also will be able to snapshot the relationship be, relationships between those images, right? So very much like today, you can deploy a virtual cluster on a cloud that uh, uses Chef or Puppet to create out-of-the-box turnkey virtual cluster, you will be able to create a turnkey chameleon appliance that, that, that will be deployable on, on bare metal. And so the users in that middle layer will operate on those appliances. We will create some of those appliances ourselves, but we will also partner with users who will create similar appliances, right? It's a great way to distribute your research uh, to create an appliance like that is a great way to provide a vehicle for reproducible research because other users will be able to take your appliance um, and deploy it. So what might the, um, the test bed look like when um, all of this is done? Well, we're going to have some persistent clouds running, uh, and like I said, we will provide OpenStack. Uh, we might provide other persistent clouds based on your requirements, but also uh, users may want to run long-running experiments um, for, for you know, whatever software and, and share it with another community. In the middle layer, well, in the, in the lowest layer, we will provide um, capabilities that I will describe shortly, but in the middle layer, we will use those capabilities, we will use the ability to, um, to stand up, uh, reconfigure resources using Chameleon appliances uh, to, to, um, to deploy a range of... Um, different appliances that we will provide, the users will provide, so we will have this chameleon appliance catalog. For the discovery, provision, configuration, and monitoring, uh, we just completed an evaluation of uh, software that uh, could do that to, to our requirements, and we settled on choices. Uh, one of them is software developed by, by the uh, Grid 5000 project in Europe. They have been running a, a, a bare metal reconfigurable testbed for 10 years now. Um, and, and have very good ways of describing the resources, and I'll talk about it in a, in a second. Uh, but we found, somewhat to our surprise and also delight, that there is actually mainstream software available now that provides a lot of the capabilities that we need. And that software is OpenStack. So uh, provisioning can be handled by OpenStack, configuration can be handled by OpenStack, and monitoring can, can be done also. So um, Rackspace, uh, several months ago, uh, released an offering called On Metal, which provides bare metal provisioning. And we're working with them and we're working with the OpenStack community to take those capabilities and extend them as needed 
for experimental environments. The uh, big attraction here is that that gives us sustainable infrastructure, infrastructure that somebody else is developing and maintaining, um, and, and we're just making small extensions, relatively small extensions to that. So what is that infrastructure going to support? Um, so here I, I will be, uh, I'm currently in charge of, of the software development process, but I'm working with uh, Warren Smith. Warren is over there. Please look at him. Uh, the picture doesn't do him justice. Uh, Warren is extremely knowledgeable technologist. So throughout this workshop, please talk to him, um, ask him questions. Feel free to ask him questions about the software we have. So with that, let me go over the experiment workflow that, uh, that most users um, see. So most people start with designing the experiment, right? Figure out what it is that you want to run and what you need in order to run it. And then you go and discover resources. And if you don't have a, a, an experimental test bed, all too often these days, you go back to the, uh, to the starting point. So you say, oh, those are, this is the experiment I want to run. Those are the resources I have. I think I need to redefine what I want to run because I don't have enough resources. We're hoping to change that. The second thing you do is you go to the test bed and you actually acquire those resources. You provision them. Then you configure them. You um, project the environment you need on those resources and interact with them. And finally, when your experiment is running, you monitor it. And then you analyze the data and discuss it and share it. As often as not, you go back to the beginning, back to the drawing board, and, and uh, design the experiment again. And I'm going to go over each of those stages now and tell you what capabilities we're going to offer. So as far as selecting and verifying resources, here are the requirements that we know about. And please come to us and tell us if those requirements are not correct or if you would like something else in the space. Also tell us if you think it's a good idea. That, that helps as well. So first of all, um, we need a complete and current representation of actual test bed resources, right? So a lot of test beds or a lot of um, you know, uh, facilities these days, you get a, a scheduler and then you get a test bed representation somewhere on the web page that decays over time, maybe doesn't always represent reality. For experimental sciences, it's extremely important to represent re reality so that the user gets exactly what they are looking for. The representation needs to be fine-grained. So what the requirements we heard is users actually uh, interested in, in things as fine-grained as serial number on the disk, right? So if somebody changed the disk on the node that I'm using, I want to know about that, right? If somebody changed the nodes, I want to know about that. It might have a different power signature than the node I was using six months ago, right? So all of that needs to be described. Machine parsable enables matchmaking, enables um, uh, efficient searches, enables a, a wide range of, um, of uh, functionalities. It needs to be versioned, right? So what was the drive on the nodes I used six months ago? I need to know if the version of the test bed changed. Um, it needs to represent hardware upgrades, ma maintenance, and, and various extensions. And then finally, it needs to be dynamically verifiable. Why does it need to be verifiable? Well. It may happen that, that there has been a failure, right? That the uh, operating system on boot d discovered bad memory regions. It's still booted, right? And, and that fools you into thinking that everything is as before the reboot, but it might not be, right? So it, it, it makes sense to run something that will verify that, make sure that we're not led into um, false assumptions. So uh, for, for representing such resource catalog, we're going to use uh, the grid 5000 registry. Um, it, it largely automates resource discovery, so it's possible. So they've got tools that, that go to the resources and discover their features, and it's, and it's largely automated with just very little of administrator help. That is a very important feature because otherwise, again, there's a tendency for the uh, testbed description to diverge from, from what actually is used by the, uh, by the resource manager. It needs to be browsable, so it provides uh, a REST interface, command line interface, and various web interfaces. It enables matchmaking. And then it also enables you to export the description of the testbed in a form that can be then ingested by the actual resource manager to make sure that those two are in sync. Right? It would be very frustrating to go to the testbed, discover some resources, and then it turns out that some nodes are offline. And in practice, you can't really, uh, reserve those nodes. 
right? So, so again, there's a lot of emphasis on providing accurate representation of the test bed. When you go to a test bed, the resources are remote. You don't get as much control, as much opportunity for fact finding as when they sit on your desk. And we also use Grid 5000 checks to provide the uh, verification <clears throat> and compare it with the description so that you can be absolutely sure and double and triple check that, that the resources you are running on are in fact the resources um, uh, you expected. Provisioning resources. So again, the, the requirements we know of is users would like to make resource leases and they would like to allocate a range of resources of different types. So you will be able to allocate different node types like I described earlier, that will, you will be able to um, allocate resources on the granularity of a rack or, or several racks, uh, resources across racks. Um, users need to be able to deploy multiple environments in one lease. So you need to be able to reconfigure that lease multiple times, power and on and off and, and, and reboot and, and so forth. Advanced reservations are, are an interesting point, and, and whether you need them or not very much depends on you know, how many users you have and what, the, uh, what those users want to do, right? If you have one user, they can be using the whole test bed on an on-demand basis. If you have uh, multiple users and they only want to use uh, you know, small amounts of nodes at the time, you don't need advanced reservations because chances are that when they come to the test bed, the resources are available on demand. Uh, but if those users want to use a large amount of resources, and we certainly hope that on our test that they will be able to scale, then you need advanced reservations so that they can come to the resource and have reasonable confidence that those resources will be provided. So uh, you've got a Gantt chart here that, that illustrates the actual use, and, and some users you can see I, I, so you've got, you've got on the y-axis, you've got different resource types. On the x-axis, you've got time. And you can see that some users are using uh, relatively uh, a lot of resources for relatively little time, and other users are uh, using it differently. There are a little resources for uh, a short amount of time. So without advanced reservations, it's very difficult to, to fit those, uh, those different usages in. And then, of course, we need functions like matchmakings and, and Gantt chart displays to make it all uh, easily accessible to the user. And for that, we're going to use OpenStack Nova. OpenStack Nova does not provide advanced reservations, but it turns out that somebody already needed them, and there is an incubated project in OpenStack called Lazar, which implements them. And we, will, we already uh, started interacting with that team and, and will leverage that. And we might have to provide some extensions for, for the users to see the Gantt charts to, uh, to expose the resource as well uh, also. So then the next phase was configure and interact, right? So uh, I already said we need to map multiple appliances uh, to a lease. So in other words, we need to be able to reconfigure multiple times, allow deep reconfiguration, including BIOS. Snapshotting, again, very important that you do you know, whatever you need to do to configure and then uh, can save that appliance. Um, if you're doing large scale, efficient appliance deployment becomes very important. You don't want to sit there for three hours while uh, hundreds of uh, images are going out to the nodes. Uh, we need to handle complex appliances, uh, virtual clusters, cloud installation. Should it be possible for users to uh, deploy a cloud of this or that type? Right, certainly, the OpenStack cloud, uh, we're going to be deploying our OpenStack cloud, we're going to be managing this way, uh, but we will also provide facilities for users to snapshot complex appliances. And you want to be able to shop, shape uh, experimental conditions with tools like Distem and, and, and similar. And so for this, we're going to use OpenStack Ironic, uh, which is a configuration server, uh, Glance, which is an image store, and metadata service to make sure that when you deploy images, has your personal information or the information that you want to have, right? You can log into them. Uh, you can access various uh, deployment-specific information. So as you can see, we're using a lot of OpenStack uh, functionality. Uh, we're leveraging stuff that was already there. And then finally, you want to, to monitor. You want to able, enable users to understand what happens during the experiment. And you want to uh, integrate resource monitoring that, that comes at uh, uh, that comes from the user resources, but also you want to directly from the user resources, but you also want to integrate infrastructure-wide monitoring. So from feedback from PDUs, we're going to have PDUs on our uh, 
on our uh, drugs, uh, uh, feedback from network switches and so forth. And then finally, you want to allow user to uh, write their own custom metrics and connect to the monitoring system uh, that aggregates them. You need high resolution metrics, so at, at a very fine grain, and you want to be able to export data for specific experiments. And this is particularly important since many of the computer science experiments are structured as you run something, then you change something, then you rerun it, then you rerun it. And you want to be able to tell the difference as much as possible automatically between those different trends. And so for that, we're using OpenStack Accelerometer, which uh, works the same way that most monitoring infrastructures work. In other words, it allows you to, uh, or it provides agents that you run on the nodes or, or on the qualities that you monitor that send uh, feedback to the aggregator and the users can uh, define their own metrics as well. Networking capabilities. Uh, so here again, I'd like to introduce uh, Joe Mambretti, who's the director of iCare and uh, Jim Chen over there. Uh, they are our, our networking chars. You know, uh, they both have forgotten more about networking than I'm ever likely to know. So if you have uh, very detailed networking questions, please talk to those wonderful people, right? Ask them uh, what happens. But here's an overview of what we're going to do. So basically, we're going to provide uh, software-defined networking capabilities, open flow capabilities, et cetera, to users. And they will be used to provide isolation. So originally, we're going to provide L3 and L2 isolation via Neutron, OpenStack Neutron. And then um, as, open, as, as we get the uh, hardware with OpenFlow switches, we're going to gradually switch to OpenFlow. We're going to have hybrid networking cap support for hybrid networking capabilities, right? So, so what happens is that the traditional networking develop a very rich set of capabilities, and you want to use those capabilities, right, together with the new SDN capabilities brought to you by OpenFlow, and we're working with Dell right now to ensure that that happens. We want to offer you programmable topologies. So, you know, back to the what I'm saying is, is, is always at the heart of a computer science experiment, you run something, you change something, you rerun. So with the, with the topologies, we heard from two types of users. One type tells us, we just want to run experiments with different topologies. So we indeed want to take our Chameleon appliance, apply a different topology to it, and rerun, right? Just change topologies that somebody programmed for us. So for that, we will provide a network, a library of topologies. But there's also another kind of users who want to program their own topologies. And, and we will provide a, a user guide on how to do that on our test bed to those users. And then, Finally, we want to integrate with resources within the testbed and external to the testbed. And, and as Joe says, there's an ocean of possibilities of what happens next, right? Of what capabilities you may want to, to do. So please talk to, to Jim and Joe uh, about specifically what you would like to do there. So the other thing, you know, other than SDN OpenFlow research, uh, that users will want to, to do on our test bed that, that it's very good for is pushing the 100G network to the limit, right? So sending large flows over that network, trying to figure out how it all works. And today, it feels like in order to large flow experiments, you know, the network is, um, is working against you in the background, right? There are all sorts of algorithms that are not geared for that sort of thing. There are policing mechanisms that are not geared for that sort of thing. So um, we've got We've got a team here that will make using the 100G plus SDN less of a challenge. We will provide chameleon appliances and services uh, and libraries also allowing users to experiment with that, make it easier than, uh, uh, than, than perhaps doing everything themselves from scratch. And Joe and Jim will also, are also responsible for our integration with Genie on the data plane. It's going to happen very quickly. Um, and then the control plane integration is probably going to take us uh, a little bit of time. And then we'll also work on establishing a common policy context. So in order to run those experiments across Genie, across Genie resources and Chameleon resources, uh, we're going to have to figure out what the MOUs for, for users of each infrastructure are. Um, high performance networks, HPC and the cloud, a very hot topic uh, right now, obviously. And uh, so we've got uh, DK Panda right over there from uh, Ohio State, who's the, 
world's foremost expert on programming infinite band switches. And I just got one slide here from him talking, uh, showing his results from Graph 500. As you can see, you've got between 4% to 9% difference from using infinite band with virtualization over infinite band with, uh, with bare metal, right? So this is a great result. Uh, this whole discussion about high performance cloud uh, versus high performance is very interesting right now. And a lot of people still feel that uh, cloud is only good for embarrassing good parallel computations, right? But if, if we stay with this mindset, we're going to diverge. Two communities are going to diverge. The high performance computing community won't be able to leverage uh, the cloud and, and uh, virtualization, all the benefits that come from it. And the community that uh, you know doesn't need tightly coupled applications, doesn't need to run tightly coupled applications, will go in a different direction. So uh, it's a very interesting research topic. It's one lesson learned from Future Grid. We've had InfiniBand for Future Grid, uh, you know, for five years. Nobody ever used it because people want to use it with virtualization. That is the interesting thing to do. And we were not able to to uh, since this is a very new area, we were not able to have them use it um, efficiently. So uh, DK and his team are going to provide chameleon appliances that make it easy for you to, to experiment with InfiniBand and with HPC in the cloud. Uh, and please talk to him if you have specific exper uh, experiments in mind, if you have specific capabilities that you will need. And then best for last, uh, we've got uh, Paul Rudd from UTSA uh, right here, so University of Texas, San Antonio, Paul really wears two hats. Paul is both a, a vice president at Rackspace and a director of cloud computing research uh, at UTSA. And at UTSA, he was able to create uh, very synergistic uh, programs of, of academia and, and industry. So for example, he created an open compute lab at UTSA where, you, where, the, uh, where, where companies contribute uh, resources they are interested in having them tested and certified, and then students who are interested in experimenting with, with new hardware and interesting capabilities can do that as well, right? So Paul is very good at finding non-zero-sum games, at finding synergies uh, between people. And then the other thing is uh, that he also started many industry-sponsored uh, um, uh, research programs at the university. So we're hoping that he'll take his two hats and, and uh, do the same thing for Chameleon. So Paul already started uh, working with faculty at um, UTSA on developing new courses. The students are going to have electronic textbooks. They will be able to not only read about concepts, but run those concepts. concepts. They will have multimedia content, and, and they will have Chameleon appliances that go with it. Right? So we realize that education creates a pipeline where students who use that for uh, courses today, we'll use that for independent projects uh, later. Uh, UTSA is also an MSI institution, so, uh, so working with them allows us to reach out to the MSI network. And then for industry outreach, uh, like I said, Paul is uh, going to work on creating a relationship between academia and industry, and specifically he's going to create an industry board and try to look for synergies between uh, industry and ourselves uh, and create industry-sponsored research projects and so forth. So please talk to Paul if you have ideas in the space, if you are interested in uh, working with industry. He's got a lot of uh, good ideas in that space. Outreach and engagement. Uh, we're going to have the industry advisory board. I already covered that. But also we're going to have the research steering committee, which tells us what the interesting upcoming programs problems are in cloud computing that our test that should prefer for, prepare for. We will also have an early user program where we'll be working with users on advanced capabilities. There are some people in the audience who joined that program already. It will be more information about it will be available um, on that early in January. And finally, we're going to have a chameleon workshop where users will be able to come and share experiences and talk to us and, and uh, have an ongoing conversation. So quick note about project schedule. Uh, we've got, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, I used to work on, on the Future Grid project. Future Grid project left us with uh, resources at uh, University of Chicago at TAC. Those are at, at the University of Chicago Research called Hotel. TAC has a resource called Alamo. 
and a, a wonderful community of researchers who are doing interesting research on those resources. So the idea for now is to adapt those resources to their use, run it in the same way that they were run on, on Future Grid, and that means run it as OpenStack clouds, and later on uh, offer that community much better um, uh, facilities when the new hardware comes in. Uh, the new hardware is expected at, on April, Fals, April Fool's Day. Uh, is expect, that's when it's expected to arrive. We're going to be then building it and testing it, and we expect it to be available on June 1st to early users, and then uh, hopefully shortly afterwards to general public. Uh, in the fall of 2016, so th this, this is the, uh, the uh, standard cloud units that will show up on April Fool's. Uh, in the fall of 2016, that's when the uh, heterogeneous uh, hardware will show up. That's when we start uh, making that available. Future Grid at Chameleon, I already covered that somewhat. Uh, it's, uh, uh, those are two OpenStack clouds at Hotel at Alamo. We've got a Chameleon portal that is available to Future Grid users right now. We're in the process of a sort of staged migration of uh, Future Grid users to become Chameleon users. Uh, we hope that it will be completed by the end of the year. But right now, our, our goal is to, you know, not to inconvenience users to as much as possible, always provide a resource that is running that they can move, move to. So anyhow, to, um, to conclude, we have a test bed here. It's a large scale test bed, um, which targets the, 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 the scalability problem that uh, is, is evolving with the uh, capabilities that the community keeps providing. It's a reconfigurable environment, right? It, we are supporting, supporting use cases from bare metal to cloud use. We provide support for reproducible experiments. That means we allow you to create the Chameleon appliance, publish it, and then somebody else can deploy that chameleon appliance on the test bed, right? So in other words, if you want to stand on the shoulders of giants, we will provide a ladder, right? And eventually, maybe even an escalator. We want to provide one-stop shopping for experimental needs, right? So you, you come to us, you get not only hardware, you get interesting capabilities, but you also get traces, and you also get workloads to experiment against, right? And, and so we would like to hear from you specifically what goes into those. And we want to engage the community. So we've got network of partnership with uh, production cloud providers, uh, but we also want to partner with the users. So the test bed is there, but if there's one thought that I want to leave you with is that the most important element of any experimental test bed are the users and the research that they work on, right? And so here's one little segue. Um, recently, somebody emailed us on the, on the Nimbus mailing and is saying, a Nimbus team, all the cloud computing problems have been solved. Right? What, what is there to work on? And, and um, a few weeks ago, uh, we had uh, a supercomputing buff uh, with AMI, uh, actually, and somebody stood up and said essentially the same thing, right? Why have cloud computing tests? But right now, when you know, we have clouds, we know what clouds are, you know, what is there to do, right? So my, my favorite way to thinking about that is, is going back to, uh, to mid-90s when we all thought we had internet, right? We, we understood what internet was. Some people made web pages. Uh, some people pub published links of, of web pages that they knew that they thought was cool. And we felt that internet was done, right? And in fact, O'Reilly even published a book called The Whole Internet, right? And um, uh, it was it so actually for the younger members of the audience. This is not a mock-up. This is an actual book that you could go to a bookstore and buy. I bought it, right? And that book essentially consisted of a listing of various websites uh, that were available at the time. And when it came out, there was indeed a little bit of criticism that it was a little bit obsolete because five more websites were added, you know, something like that, right? So we thought that we had it fairly well under control at the time. Um, but we didn't think about things like uh, you know, content distribution networks that eventually rendered books like this obsolete, like social networks, like e-commerce, and cloud computing. Right? So now we feel clearly there's a lot of optimism in the community that we have cloud computing under control. And somebody might even run out and publish a book about cloud computing. Right? But before we all do that, 
you know, let's consider all that data that is right now streaming in uh, and, and needs to be processed and needs to be turned into insight and all the wonderful things that people can do. People can now detect earthquakes with their iPhones. It is not too far fetched to think. I think that, you know, if you consider the costs of deployment in the, in the earthquake community, it might be actually economically viable to start handing out uh, iPhones to people. And what else can we put on them and what more data can we contribute? And of course, that will create a huge problem of scale, right? All that data streaming in will create a huge problem of scale, right? Congestion in networks, not being able to provide response time. We clearly need to acquire more control over the networks, the resources, and the storage um, and, and the data processing capabilities that we have. So. Please don't think that cloud computing is done. Go out, seek out new challenges, and when you do so, come in around on our testnet. So this is all I have. We will have time for questions later, but right now I have some good news. Break time. <laughs>